I am, I, I'm an introvert that ex- appears as an extrovert. Uh, but for whatever reason, I never want to be a protagonist in my narrative stuff. I never really want to initiate the first scenes or even some of our monopop shows. I've had entire shows where I never actually was one of the key players on the stage. Mm-hmm. I just did occasional wave offs and cut twos. And uh, I, I like the ability to be able to do that. I think it's such an important role to have Mm -hmm. because I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of times people are, you know, trying to get their 10 minutes. They're like, look at me. I'm so great. I'm the best. And I mean, those people don't often spend a lot of time in improv, to be honest. But um, like there are certainly people who will enjoy their time being the lead players and never... Um, allow to be a supporting person, you know, and, and in the less toxic version of that, it's nice to have a partner partner in your team to, that will be the side player. I mean, mm-hmm. I love doing support roles. If people would let me, I would do it. People never let me. <laughs> um, you're so good. No, it's because <laughs> you, so when, you, when you've been around long enough that most of the people that you're in any jam with, you've taught more than half of them, mm-hmm. like they defer to you. Like, I actually asked Nathan how it felt because I knew it was going to happen to him once he became the conservatory director. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Um, what's it like to do scenes now? Do they talk or do they stare at you until you say something? Because that's what they do. Like, every scene I'm in forever, anytime, people, I walk on and then people just look at me and wait. Mm -hmm. And I'm all like, all right, I guess I'll have the first line. But usually I like to be like, hey, I don't know. Who knows what I what I what part I can play? I can be here for you. What do you got? What do you mm-hmm. got? But you know, people oftentimes just and they and Nathan said they did it to him too. Like after a while, when a lot of the people in the jam were students that he had taught, mm-hmm. they would walk onto a scene with him and just defer to whatever he wanted. And it was like, no, man, embrace it. Take whatever you want. We I wanted still, to give you the power. I still get like that with Nathan. Like there's <laughs> even Lisa. I'm in a weekly troupe with her. I've been performing with her for eight months now and for whatever reason improv is a funny world where like if someone's had a year more of experience than me they're god and i can't touch them so i should just kind of bow down and recently i've finally gotten the confidence to just say fuck it like if if they don't like something i do that's fine uh but yeah in fact i think i've recently played in a jam with nathan where i kind (laughs) of looked at him like Go ahead, tell me what to do. <laughs> I feel about different levels of experience in a troupe uh, the way um, a couple a couple months ago I worked an event at the theater that was not a theater event. It was a uh, it was like a tech uh, tech companies got together to have a discussion on diversity, yeah. and I just happened to be the house manager that day, mm-hmm. and um, they were engaging. So I sat in on their talk. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was super interesting that one of the things that they were trying to say was, um, we need to put diversity in every workplace, but we don't need to put it in, in a way that is, that is forced. Like these people, we need to make sure everybody's got a job so much as let's talk about it in a real, we all have different ways of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. We have had different levels of experience in the job that we do. And we've come from different backgrounds. When we're working on a project together, we need those people Mm -hmm. of all different points of view so that they can both represent the part of the consumer base that they represent and also so that wherever they learned, whatever school they went to, jobs they had before, they can bring in their knowledge from that. Same with improv troops, people of different levels and from different places. I think it's so important because it's like we're all receiving the information in different ways. We've all taken different levels. Mm -hmm. Um, The people that taught us were different than, you know, what, how it works out. Uh, The experiences we've had on the stage in other venues Mm -hmm. all brings to stage this perfect little thing. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's so necessary to have different ways of looking at it in the same way that in this diversity seminar, they were saying people of diverse backgrounds need to be in a workplace. I was like, yeah. Totally. Absolutely. And it was a perfect way to describe how you can put something together. Right. Well, in improv, it's so important to have diversity. But then I also do find value in, like, watching the same improv together and uh, doing, like, seeing and doing the same improv to get on the same page. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because just, I've found that when I 
improvise, let's say, with people from all different theaters. Like, some of the worst jams I've done have been people from all different backgrounds together using their personal techniques and styles, and Mm -hmm. it just doesn't mesh. But then when you're able to get those people together, like Channel 2, uh, and they spend time together, they get to know each other, they kind of watch some of the same shows together, and once they're on that same page, it's the most beautiful work of art on a stage I've seen. Oh, yeah. Channel 2 is a great example of that. Anyone listening to this needs to go watch them. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Um, Yeah, they're very fun. Um, But, I mean, I feel like that's almost the... uh, Literally... uh, in the example of the diversity thing, uh, like m- seminar that I, they were like, yeah, it is going to be hard that first time. Mm-hmm. The first time it's going to feel real clunky. And you're right in a jam where it's a bunch of strangers that haven't worked together, but every job, every, you know, team, whether it's at a tech company or an improv troupe are people who over time get mm-hmm. to know each other can use their skills. I mean, we can't, if I met somebody for 20 minutes, I can't really use every skill that I truly have because I don't know right. what's necessary for our conversation. I don't know. You know, I, I pick and choose based on how I feel like it works in the moment. Mm-hmm. And if I'm, if I do a jam and I think a bunch of people are going to defer to me, I try to give them scenes they want to do. Right. Like that's another part of teaching that I think is really important I use level one to make people less scared um, of putting their ideas out there, no Mm -hmm. matter what those ideas are. And so part of what I do is I make their job not just to say stuff out of their mouths, but also to um, pay attention to the other people. Mm -hmm. And not only do I say it's really important for you to know each other person in this room because someday you're going to be in a scene with them. And if you know he loves making sci-fi references, you know what to tell him to get him really interested immediately in the scene. Or Mm -hmm. if this person constantly plays, you know, animal characters. Yep. You know, you can swing right in and you know they like that. So they're going to, you know, see what choices they make on their own. Mm -hmm. And then that's what you know of them. You can give them what they like. And I, I use it so that they're not focusing on themselves Mm -hmm. so that they're not going, Oh God, what am I going to say? How's it going to go? Instead, I would say, look at the person you're in a scene with. What do they want? Mm -hmm. And then hopefully that allows them to reflect it on the other person and feel like they're helping somebody versus like, I'm the coolest or, Oh my God, everything I say is stupid. Right. So well, and just being okay with like I, I'm in I'm the worst with pop culture references. <laughs> I mean the worst. Me I mean too. I'm so embarrassed. There are people who will name presidents that I'm like, who was that? Was that a rap rapper <laughs> with Doctor Ford? Who was that? Uh, but just being okay with a not knowing and b just being an expert on the fucking thing. Yeah, of course, Mister Ford. He wrote uh, War and Peace. Yeah, yeah. I met him personally. Yeah, and just you know what? That's a fun scene. You look like an asshole, but the audience loves that. Yeah, and that was hard for me because I'm I consider myself by nature a perfectionist, uh, which is really difficult to do with improv when yeah. you're dealing with so many things out of your control. But I've learned that I'm I'm. I'm comfortable improvising when I'm okay with just saying whatever comes out of my mouth and just defending it. Absolutely. I'm an expert in everything out of my mouth. Uh, Gosh, I was once in a show where I had to... um, I'm trying to remember. I had to narrate... I think it was this... Oh, no, I'm going to sound like an asshole even trying to remember what the name of it was. It was like the (laughs) Spanish Inquisition. And, of course, that's like a word I remember from seventh grade. But outside of that... I don't know, a bunch of Spaniards that were curious. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of questions. They yeah. Were inquiries. They were yeah. collaborating with the French, I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> Collaborations all over history. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but then we ended up having a really great improv scene that came from the Spanish collaborating with the French. <laughs> <laughs> I love to re uh, take words uh, that people think mean one thing for sure mm-hmm. and change it totally. Oh, yeah. Oh, those are the most fun. You know what I find also really funny but frustrating is uh, accents in improv. I don't know what it is. I am a Jewish girl. I come from a loud Jewish family. I've listened to loud Jewish mothers nagging constantly. And the second I need to use that, uh, that accent that's in my pocket... Like German comes out or oh, yeah. Swedish, it's it's like mm-hmm. I can't do it. And then you get home in the car and you're like, where the hell was that? But the audience eats it up. I yeah. mean, 
I, I once had to do a, worst. I had to do an improvised uh, stand-up routine as Elmer Fudd a couple weeks ago, <laughs> and I didn't remember what he sounded like, so I just picked a name, I picked a stutter, and just committed to it. Uh, and in no way is that Elmer Fudd in any way, shape, or form. And I then did a. 10 minute stand up routine as a fucked up Elmer Fudd. And the audience loved it. <laughs> but I've also had plenty of failed by that logic as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes they're with you and sometimes they're not. Yeah. I think sometimes if you just try, then the uh, audience will be happy to be have your back in that moment <laughs> yeah. um usually it's it's like uh i try to use uh, a little bit of the like you like me right come on yeah um i'm horrible with accents though my husband makes fun of me so much we want we were watching a television show the other day where there was a character that was a jamaican and that person on the screen was doing a proper jamaican accent and my husband goes oh that sounds like your irish accent and i was like <laughs> yeah well, thanks let's, let's hear it it, no, I can't. No, that I bad? swear. It's so bad. I start with, like, I always go, like, don't you know? And I'm like, nope, that's <laughs> Minnesota. And I'm like, oh, are you getting the... Oh, I can't even do it. Yeah, it's like some the geriatric. Shire, so, <laughs> yeah. like, it's horrible. I end up moving, yeah, it's like Minnesota to Irish to Jamaican. But you know what? It lands what. for people like me who don't know pop culture or any references. So to me, I'm like, that sounds like a great Jamaican accent. I don't know why people are scoffing <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you're talking too about like the accents you have in your back pocket i grew up in boston you'd mm -hmm. think that i'd have a good boston accent i can't do it i end up doing the horrible kennedy one the kennedy one's wrong <laughs> no one sounds like the kennedys only the kennedys sound like the kennedys no well, one else I'm sounds to like think them of what an actual bostonite sounds like Oh no! I'm putting you under pressure. Uh, no, again. it's it's like uh, it's like if you, mean, if you right? took a lot of um, drugs and then your your tongue was like uh, this and the uh, there's just I remember when I I got my wisdom teeth taken out my accent was very strong and I was like oh it's back. They pack the car, right? Um, I, oh, is it's that? More like, no, that try. one's it. <laughs> that's what everyone says. Pack the car and have it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. how they do it. But. Mm -hmm. uh, Usually I, I try to get into it with, uh, you like these apples? You know, that's my, <laughs> you know, if you if you want to you wanna jump right in. Uh, or you think you're better than me? There you go. <laughs> that was good. There you go. You think you're better than me? See, that's the number one. You don't have time to workshop this in an improv scene, unfortunately. Yeah, see? So, no, yeah. and I'm not confident in it. If I were confident <laughs> just to jump in it, sure. Um, I need to take a class in it because they say you can come up with like a touchstone phrase and that that'll just like make you go into it. Get like it going. you can use that and just say that one line and then it'll just, bloop, and then you're just in the accent. If you, you know, exercise that part of your brain, I suppose it's like anything. Yeah. I, I actually downloaded an app. I was at a UCB show a couple of years ago in New York and I was so impressed with how these guys were able to pull these accents out of their pants. Uh, and I, downloaded an app on my phone that is supposed to teach you different dialects. Uh, and so I tried to spend about a week learning how to speak like a proper Boston accent in New Yorker and like to differentiate how to speak like people from London. Uh, and then after about a week and a half of spending probably a hundred hours on this, I realized that it was not going to be a returning investment for my improv because I got no better. Uh, and on top of that, I am not an improviser who's here to get better to make this a career. I just do this for fun. Yeah. So I aborted that real quick. <laughs> I feel like that app would work really well for, like, actors who have to do a specific role. Well, you'd say over and over, you say, like, like pack the car. And so I found myself walking around, like, hall I'd just walk around New York, just pack the car pack the car and I probably look like a total psycho <laughs> I don't know actually maybe not in New York <laughs> very regular yeah, pack the car They're pack like, the mm, car this, seems, this makes sense yeah. that person needs to remember to park the car is what they were saying <laughs> yeah. to themselves what a logical thing to do yeah they, they just thought you were the smartest they're like oh I should do that Good. Hey, buy, thanks, groceries. buy groceries buy groceries <laughs> yeah. you start a whole thing <laughs> oh, that's funny. oh yeah so uh, with reference to you mentioned a second ago that you just do um improv as a hobby mm -hmm. um how did you i know that you got into it through the group on but like um since you've maintained your uh career um and and that's real estate correct yes um you how has doing the improv helped you and then also do you think have you spoken to other people in the industry and said like oh you have to do this or is it really more of a you personally find it 
um, enriching in a way that helps you or doesn't help you. Who knows? Oh, I mean, hands down, it has been helpful for me in life and. 